ايه؟ انا ساعات بيج بن يعني 8 8 مش 8 دقيقه يعني طيب ماشي الدكتور الدكتور طارق بيج بن حاضر يلا ابتدي باذن الله. Good evening my colleague we'll start our general surgery webinar about diabetic food. Today we have six speakers. Six speakers the first one Professor Daria Saleh. It is a professor of anatomy and health surgical department in Mansoura University, Egypt. And the uh, second uh, one is Dr. Maurar Rashid, consultant surgeon at Qasper Hospital. And Dr. Samah Swifi is. You mean Samah Swifi? Samah Safti, Dr. Tar? Samah Safti, sorry. Yeah, Dr. Tar. I wish you would speak. Samah Safti. Senior Consultant uh, Orthopedic Surgery, Dr. Ahmed, uh, Professor Ahmed uh, Khalaf is a uh, professor of uh, vascular surgery and uh, head of the vascular department in Ras Khiba. And uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Subhi, it is consultant uh, uh, epidemiology and infectious disease. And uh, uh, last one, uh, uh, Dr. Peter from MOH, it is our monitorist. She will lecture us about the role of interest in diabetic food. I will, first, please all can unmute because it is so difficult to hear everyone. Just speaker, we can, sorry, all mute and just speaker will unmute, okay? I will lift the mic for, Dr. Fatah Rahman Idris is a senior consultant in general surgery in Qasmi Hospital. He will be moderator of this webinar. So please, Dr. Fatah. Good evening, everyone, and welcome all. Uh, so our uh, webinar today will be uh, under the topic of uh, diabetic foot uh, clinical discussion. Uh, it will be divided in six sessions, and the question uh, will be uh, it's supposed to be dropped in the chat box and it will be answered at the end of each and every session. So the first session will be uh, delivered by Dr. Dalia, who is a professor of anatomy in Mansoura University. And it will be about the applied clinical uh, anatomy of uh, diabetic foot. Uh, welcome, Dr. Dalia. You can start. Thank you, doctor. Uh, thanks, doctor, for introducing me, and uh, thanks for the invitation uh, to talk about the anatomy uh, of the diabetic foot. Uh, my objective is uh, going to be the following. First, I will talk about uh, the skeleton uh, of the arches of the foot and how they are supported. Uh, the deep fascia and the, and the plantar fascia is faced, and finally, the plantar boy of the foot and ankle. Uh, as you all know that uh, the skeleton of the foot is made of uh, three sets of bones. We have the tarsals, the metatarsals, and uh, the phalanges. Uh, this anterior line uh, represents the tarsal metatarsal joints, and this uh, posterior line here represents the transverse tarsal joints. So these two joints, or these two lines, will divide the foot into uh, three parts. The hind foot, its skeleton is made by the talus and the calcaneus. Uh, the midfoot, uh, its skeleton is, is made by the navicular, the forms, and the cupoid bone. And this is the fourth foot. Its skeleton is made by the metatarsals and the phalanges. Uh, the skeleton of the foot, when uh, the bones are uh, integrated together and articulated together, it is said to be uh, in the form of a continuous twisted longitudinal arch. Its posterior end rests on the posterior end of the calcaneus and extends anteriorly to the head of the metatarsal. It is higher on the medial side than on the lateral side, so we have two arches, uh, the medial longitudinal arch, as we can see here, 
Uh, it is made of the following bones. Its keystone is the talus. Its posterior pillar is made by the calcaneus, while its anterior pillar is made by the navicular, the three cuneiforms, and the three medial metatarsals. Uh, while on the lateral side, we have uh, the lateral longitudinal arch. Its uh, keystone is made by the cupoid bone, its posterior pillar by the calcaneus, while its anterior pillar is made by the lateral two metatarsals. Uh, these two uh, longitudinal arches combine together in a form of a fundamental longitudinal arch. It is made by the calcaneus, the cupoid, the third cuneiform, and the third metatarsal. If you remove the rest of the bones of the foot, this arch will not be uh, disturbed. Um, as any arch, it should be supported by three factors. Uh, the shape of the articulating bones together, we call it the bony factor. And then the ligaments that hold these bones together, we call it the ligamentous factor. And finally, the pull action of the muscles around these uh, arches. So for the medial longitudinal arch, it is mainly supported by the ligaments and the muscles, not by the bony factor. Uh, the most important ligaments that hold this uh, arch is the plantar aponeurosis and the spring ligament or the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament because this ligament holds the weak point in the arch. The weak point in the arch is the talonavicular joint. So this uh, ligament supports it uh, from below. Also, the action of the long flexors uh, uh, for the two, like the flexor halosis and the flexor digitorum longus, and also the action of the tibialis posterior, tibialis anterior, and the intrinsic muscles on the foot also support this arch. For the lateral longitudinal arch, it is supported by the three factors, supported by the ligaments, the muscles, and also by the shape of the bones, especially the wedge-shaped cupoid bone. Uh, for the ligaments, we have the plantar aponeurosis and the long and short uh, plantar ligaments that hold the uh, calcaneus to the cupoid. Uh, for the tendons and the muscles for this arch, we have the peroneus longus tendon and um, the short muscles for the little feet. The other form of arches that are found in the sole of the foot are the transverse arches. Uh, these are a series of smaller arches that cross uh, the sole of the foot. They pass through the head of the talus till the head of the metatarsal. The highest one or the most prominent one lies at the midfoot, uh, at the level of the tarsal and the tarsal joint. It is made by the three cuneiforms, the cupoid and the bases of the metatarsal. Uh, the middle cuneiform is considered to be the keystone for this arch. Uh, the transverse arches of the foot are supported by the shape of the bones because the bones uh, in the mid tarsal region are wedge shaped, so they together they form the, the shape of the arch. It's also supported by the ligaments like the tarsal and tarsal ligaments, but the most important factor that keeps this arch is the tendon of peroneus longus. As you can see, it, uh, it crosses the sole of the foot from lateral to medial, so it always pulls the medial end of the uh, arch towards its lateral side. It is assisted by the transverse head of the adductor halosis muscle. Uh, next, I will talk about the deep fascia of the sole of the foot. Uh, the deep fascia is thickened at the sole of the foot in its central part to form the plantar aponeurosis. It is uh, triangular in shape. Its uh, apex is attached to the calcaneus, while its base splits into five slips to blend with the connective tissue around the fibrous flexor sheath of the tooth. Uh, these slips are connected together by ligaments, thus limiting the fanning or the abduction of the tooth. The plantar aponeurosis has many uh, functions. It gives a firm attachment to the overlying skin, thus gives it stability during walking. Also, it gives uh, a point for attachment of the intrinsic muscles of the foot. It also protects the underlying soft tissue like the vessels, nerves of the sole of the foot. And what concerns us here is that it assists in maintaining and keeping the integrity of the arches of the foot. Because the plantar aponeurosis is made of collagen, so it is not stretchable. So upon dorsiflexion of the tooth, it will wind around the heads of the metatarsal, thus keeping the posterior end to the anterior end of the um, longitudinal arches together and raising uh, the arch. Um, since it is... Uh, act like a spring, so it, uh, it acts as a leverage and also absorbs shocks during walking, sprinting, and jumping, and so on. At the same time, in this cross-section, we can see that the plantar aponeurosis sends two septa, medial intermuscular septum, to the base of the uh, first metatarsal bone, and also lateral intermuscular septum to the undersurface of the third metatarsal bone. 
These septa together with the interosseous septal fascia, they divide uh, the plantar aspect of the foot into compartments. We have the central compartment, which contains uh, the centrally located muscles of the sole of the foot, like uh, the flexor digitorum crevis, the uh, quadratus plantae or adductor halysis. Also, the main vessels and nerves of the sole lies in this central compartment. We also have the interosseous compartment, which contains the dorsal and the plantar interossei. The lateral compartment, which contains the short muscles of the little toe, and a medial compartment for uh, the short muscles of the big toe. Um, in these two pictures, we can see the plantar fascial spaces, and they are arranged from superficial to deep. So the superficial one lies uh, subcutaneous or superficial uh, to the calcaneus and the plantar bruses. Uh, the second space lies between the flexors. Um, Digitorum profundus and uh, plantar aponeurosis. The third space lies between the flexor digitorum profundus and the quadratus plantae muscles. And the fourth space lies between the quadratus plantae and the tarsal bones. Finally, uh, the fifth space lies deep to the adductor hands. What's the significance of these spatial spaces? Um, space number one, or the superficial uh, space to the calcaneus and the plantar aponeurosis is confined, and if there is infection there, it will not spread to the other uh, facial spaces, while the spaces from number two to five communicate with each other, so if infection in one space could be transmitted to the one above or below it. The most important one we need to remember is the third space, because uh, this one um, with minimal pressure, its anterior septum could break down and the infection could spread towards the tooth. And also because the neurovascular bundle of the sole lies in this space, uh, infection could be transmitted along with the neurovascular bundle back under the flexor retinaculum uh, up to the posterior compartment of the leg. Uh, finally, I will talk about the blood supply of the foot and ankle. First, let's start with the definition of the word angiosome. It is an anatomical unit that uh, made of the skin, subcutaneous tissue, uh, fascia, muscles, and bones. They are supplied by what's called source artery. Adjacent uh, angiosomes, as we can see here, are separated from each other or bordered from each other by chalk vessels. And the, the chalk vessels are vessels of smaller diameter than the source arteries, but they have the ability to dilate and increase the blood flow inside them if there is obstruction of, of one of the source arteries. In the photo uh, and ankle, we have six different angiosomes um, supplied by the three main arteries of the leg. We have the posterior tibial artery for the sole, the anterior tibial artery for the dorsum of the foot, and the peroneal artery for the lateral supramalular area and the heel. In this uh, diagram, we can see a summary for the foot and ankle angiosomes. Here is the vessels at the dorsum of the foot, and here are uh, the vessels at the uh, plantar surface of the foot. So the dorsum of the foot, as we can see here, is supplied by branches from the dorsalis pedis artery, which comes from the anterior tibial artery. Uh, the heel region um, is supplied by branches or calcaneal branches from both the posterior tibial artery and uh, the peroneal artery. The medial third of the sole of the foot is supplied by branches from the medial plantar artery, while the lateral two thirds of the sole of the foot plus the digits or the four twos are supplied by branches from the lateral plantar artery. They both come from the posterior tibial artery. Finally, uh, the big two is supplied by branches from both the dorsalis pedis artery, the medial, and the lateral plantar arteries. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. I tried to make it in 10 minutes or so. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Dr. Fatifi, thank you, Professor uh, Dahlia, for uh, this nice presentation. Uh, any question in the chat? Or? Hello? None, I'm at the time being. That is no question here. Yeah, because okay. it's anatomy or facts, so there's no question. <laughs> thank yeah, you. for sure, for sure. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. That is good and informative presentation for anatomy. It's essential for, for management. Yeah. So, uh, as long as there are no questions, we will move to the second uh, session. Uh,
which is about the guidelines and management of diabetic foot. And it will be delivered by Dr. Marwan, a consultant surgeon in Al-Qasim Hospital. You are very welcome, Dr. Marwan, you can take over. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Fathi. Uh, good evening, all. Thank you, Dr. Adalia, for your nice presentation. We enjoy it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start my presentation. The guidelines and the standard of care for the management of diabetic foot infection. Okay. The main objectives of the the guidelines, the, the, this the, this topic is the, about the introduction, the pathophysiology and the etiology of diabetic foot ulcer. And the guideline on the standard of care, uh, we will talk, I will talk about the surgical debridement, choice of the dressing, clothing, vascular assessment and intervention protocols, treatment of active infection, the glycemic control, multidisciplinary care, and adjuvant therapy. The aim of the standard of care and the guidelines for the treatment of diabetic foot infection to improve our standard of care, to shorten the hospital stay of the patient, to provide the patient with the best cost-effective care, and to improve the awareness of the proposed multidisciplinary team, and also to reduce the primary amputation rate, use and prevent future complication, and to improve the quality of the patient life. After the introduction, as we know, Diabetic foot ulcers are a prevalent complication of diabetes mellitus and account for a significant morbidity, mortality, and healthcare expenditures. It is estimated that 19 to 34% of patients with diabetes are likely to be affected with diabetic foot ulcers in their lifetimes. And the international diabetes reports that 9.1 to 26.1 million people will develop diabetic foot ulcer annually. A population-based cohort study in the United Kingdom demonstrated that the development of the diabetic foot ulcer is associated with the 5% mortality in the first year and 42 mortality within the, five, within the five years. So the patients with diabetic foot ulcers were, were also found to have 2.5 fold increased risk of death compared with their diabetic counterparts without foot wounds. Furthermore, the patient living with diabetic foot also suffer great morbidity, lower health related to quality of life, um, psychosocial adjustment, and have a high burden of healthcare interaction. Treatment of diabetic foot ulcers account for approximately one third of the total cost of diabetic care. Despite these high health care costs, about 20% of patients have unhealed diabetic foot ulcers after one year. So it is an increasingly recognized that the foot ulcers recurrence is common and occurring in about in up to 50% of cases and using the term in rem has been deemed more appropriate than describing an ulcer as a heel. Although there are well-established principles to managing diabetic foot ulcers and infection, treatment is often challenging. And because are preceded by foot ulceration, a thorough understanding of the causes and management of ulceration is essential. This is a diagram of the pathophysiology and the etiology of diabetic foot ulcers that happened in diabetic patients. We have many causes, the neuropathy affecting the, the sensory, the motor, and the autonomic neuropathy causing loss of the protective sensation, foot deformity and joint rigidity, dry skin and decreased integrity. Uh, this is causing unnoticed repetitive trauma and improper loading with abnormal plantar pressures, as Dr. Adalia, she 
explained uh, clearly to us the arches and the traction between the arches and to maintain stability of the foot, it's very important. The cracks and the fissures in the skin also, all of them causing ulcer. If they are associated with ischemia due to the PAD, peripheral arterial disease, so this will lead to the infections and ulcerations and end it finally with amputation. And we can add more, the walking with the, with the bare foot and inappropriate, in, inappropriate footwear from the diabetic patients and lack of the education, the proper education to the patient about the, the care about their foot and the lack of education to the GPs, the healthcare providers about the examination, the instructions, and the lack of the photo protection devices, all of these things increase increasing the risk of the infections and the ulcerations and finally end the two amputations. And also we have one of the important deformities, the charcoal deformity, it's caused by also the neuropathy with the repetitive trauma and part of an inflammatory reactions causing foot deformity. This will increase and burden the infections and ulcerations in the foot and leading to amputation. And this is an example of the uh, X-ray for features of the charcoal deformity. We can see the extensive destructions of the midfoot and loss of the all and collapse of the arch. All of these arches has been run and loss of the foot stability. Now we will go to the guidelines and the standard of care. Shortly after the diabetic foot ulcers were described in 19th century, the most prevalent treatment approach was the prolonged bed rest. Dr. Frederick Trees revolutionized the management of diabetic foot ulcer when he established the three important principles in the diabetic foot ulcers, which continue to be the basis of modern daycare, sharp debridement, offloading, and diabetic foot education. So we still we are using this as the same principle uh, in, in, in our uh, management. So the building on the, these principles, the pillars of the treatment today include the following. Surgical debridement, dressing, and the dressing it should promoting moist wound environment and control wound exodus. Wound offloading, vascular assessment and intervention protocol, treatment of active infection, glycemic control. The work should be in the multidisciplinary tinker. And finally, we can add the many adjuvant therapy help us to improve uh, the healing process of the diabetic foot ulcer. This is the standard of practice for what did I say? And it's all of them, uh, the recommendation were sit wrong for them. Uh, now I will go for the surgical deprivement. The surgical deprivement involves the removal of the only necrotic and vitalized tissue that is incompatible with healing. This process aids in the granulation tissue formation and re -epithelization. The vitalized tissue provides a safe haven for a bacterial proliferation. A barrier uh, uh, for antibiotics to reach bacterial pathogens. In addition, it limits the body cellular defense to fight infection. So the removal of the devitalized tissue, the devitalized tissue reduce the bacterial bio burden. The Infectious Disease Society of America and the Wound Healing Society, wound, wound healing society recommend sharp debridement over topical debridement agents, like autolytic dressing and biological debridement and mechanical debridement. Sharp debridement has been found to be effective in several clinical trials. We will go for the next standard of care, which is the type of the dressing. Generally, it is generally agreed that the goal of the dressing should be, should be to create a moist environment. This is the moist environment will promote granulation, autolytic process, angiogenesis, and more rapid migration of the epidermal cells across the wound base. The selected dressing should also be appropriate to manage excess wound exudate and to protect the peri ulcer skin because the peri wound maceration and continuous contact with the wound exudate can enlarge the wound and impede the healing. And the selection of the dressing that stay should be stay in place minimize shear and friction, and does not cause additional harm or tissue damage. The wound location and the peri-wound skin quality and the patient activity, all of these things can affect the choice of the dressing. Still, the diabetic 
food ulcers are heterogeneous and different. So there is no single dressing is ideal for all types. A wide range of the dressing types are available and several are currently being studied. The wound of loading, wound of loading, sorry. Uh, the, 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 the plantar shear force of stress, which is the horizontal component of the ground reaction forces, and to a lesser degree, a vertical plantar pressure, are a major causative factor in the development and the, of the diabetic foot ulcer and the poor healing of the diabetic foot ulcer. And increase the plantar pressure under the forefoot, forefoot has identified a major risk factor for ulceration. Relieving the plantar pressure and shear, shear uh, stress uh, from the diabetic foot ulcer is a vital part of wound care and it promotes healing and prevents recurrence. Offloading can be achieved by many mechanisms, include, including shoe modification, boots, orthotic walker. Uh, this model, uh, the modality uh, choice should be based on the location of the wound history of the peripheral arterial disease and the presence of infection. The total contact casting is often considered the gold standard device for plantar ulcer. Although total contact casting as well as other non-removable device shouldn't be used in those with significant peripheral arterial disease or infection. The studies have shown that total, uh, both total contact casting and knee-high removable walker reduce peak pressure in foot and forefoot up to the 87% as they redistribute the plantar pressure to the entire weight bearing surface of the foot, as well as lower the, uh, lower the leg through the device wall. The device wall. Offloading shoes, cast shoes, and custom-made temporary shoes appear to be effective in healing diabetic foot ulcer. The International Working Group on Diabetic Foot recommends that these options be used for plantar pressure, uh, plantar ulcer, sorry, in patients for whom knee uh, high device are contraindicated or not to tolerated. Faulted foam with appropriate footwear can be used if no other biomechanical offloading is available. And surgical offloading should only be used if conservative management has been felt in high risk patient and this a surgical intervention uh, it is, uh, can be done by the, our colleague, the uh, orthopedics. You can see in these uh, two uh, pictures, we can see this is the big charcoal foot, deformed foot, and there is an ulcer on the medial side. And this is the, the foot, the foam foot. Uh, and also there is, there is an ulcer in the uh, plantar pressure also on the neuropathic pressure also on the plantar side of the foot, and there is a multiple layer of the salt padding uh, to, to distribute the pressure all over the plantar side. A vascular assessment. The peripheral arterial disease is estimated to occur in 40% of patients with diabetic foot ulcer. Patients who have uh, comorbid diabetic foot ulcers and peripheral arterial disease have a slower healing and high major um, amputation rates and high mortality rates. It's recommended that those ulcer be evaluated for the uh, peripheral arterial disease by palpating the pedal pulses or ankle brachial indexes using handheld Doppler and duplex arterial ultrasound, and also using the wound ischemia and foot infection classification systems as a means to stratify the amputation risk and revascularization benefits in patients with diabetic foot ulcers and peripheral arterial disease. Clinically significant arterial disease should be ruled out by establishing that the pedal pulse are clearly palpable, or that the ankle brachial index is more than 0.9, or the presence of the ankle brachial index more than 1.3 suggests non-compressible arteries. And the color duplex ultrasound scanning provides anatomic and physiological data confirming in ischemic etiology of the leg wound, as, we, as, as it's obvious in this uh, diagram. Uh, I can uh, just clarify, this is the Wi-Fi classification. It is it's with the three uh, parts. The first one is the wound, and the second one is the ischemic, and the third 
uh, column uh, from the infection grade. So the wound we can see it is a shallow wound, small, deeper, and extensive wound. And from the ischemic, we can see by depending on the transcutaneous pressure or ankle breaker uh, uh, index or uh, ankle systolic pressure. We can stratify the uh, degree of the ischemia. And from the infection, we can see for the presence of size of infections, local signs, more than local. And the, the third one is the association with the systemic inflammatory response syndromes. And this is that the severe type of the diabetic foot infection. If this one, three, and if there is severe ischemia, so there is a high risk for the patient and he is in high risk of amputations and morbidity with a high risk of mortality also. The vascular intervention protocol uh, perform at least one of the mentioned above bedside tests and use the wound, uh, wound ischemia and foot uh, infection classification system as a means to stratify the amputation risk and revascularization benefit in patients with diabetic foot, ulcer, and peripheral arterial disease. Always consider vascular imaging in patients with diabetic foot ulcer, irrespective of result of side test. When the ulcer is not healing within four to six weeks, despite good standard of care, and we can, we can see many cases of the diabetic foot ulcer, non-healing ulcer in our daily practice, still chronic non-healing is due to presence of underlying peripheral vascular disease. Always consider the revascularizations in a patient with diabetic foot ulcer and peripheral arterial disease irrespective of the results of bedside test when the ulcer is non, not healing within four to six weeks despite optimal management. Use any of the following modality to obtain anatomical information. You can use the modality to obtain anatomical information when considering revascularization for a patient lower extremities, like a color duplex ultrasound, CT scan angiography, magnetic resonance angiography, or intra-arterial digital subtraction angiography. As we can see in this image, uh, the stenting of the uh, femoral and the re uh, revascularization. The aim to restore the direct, to restore the direct blood flow to at least one of the foot arteries preferably to the, the, the artery that supplies the anatomical region of the ulcer, and whatever an endo, endovascular open or hyper revascularization technique has been used, as we, as, as we saw in the anatomical uh, blood supply of the foot, it is uh, supplied by the anterior, posterior tibial, peroneal artery. So all of, the, all of these things, any one of them, it can be open regard, uh, according to the anatomical size of the ulcer. The treatment of an active infection. The wound infection is a non predictor of the poor wound healing and the medications. The appropriate recognition of the infection and the treatment with antibiotics in diabetic foot infection is imperative to improve outcome. If there is a suspected, suspected infection in a debride ulcer or if the abyssalization uh, from the margin is not progressing within two weeks of debridement, and the initiation of offloading therapy, determine the type and the level of the infection in the debride diabetic ulcer by tissue biopsy or by validated quantitative swab technique. High levels of bacteria impede wound healing and surgical wound closure. Culture should be performed to isolate both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. The Infectious Disease Society of America has outlined specific guidelines for the treatment of diabetic foot infection. Uh, they are using this is the, the classification of uh, PEAT uh, by the American uh, Infectious uh, Society of America. It is by depending on the, the severity, the P from ischemia, perfusion, and the extent, and the depth, and the infection, and sensation. So we will come back again for the shallow shallow uh, uh, ulcers and deep ulcer with infection and uh, deep ulcers with the systemic inflammatory response syndromes and this is the severe type. So we have un uninfected, mild, moderate, and severe. It's recommended that before antibiotic therapy, deep tissue culture via biopsy or cortage after the bridement be obtained. 
culture directed antibiotic treatment provides a better clinical outcome than the empiric therapy. If the diabetic foot osteomyelitis, uh, if the diabetic is suspected, so the bone specimen should be obtained to identify the bacterial pathogen and to direct the antibiotic therapy. I will talk uh, shortly about the diabetic foot osteomyelitis because it is account for the 20% of mild to moderate infection and 50 to 60% of severely infected diabetic foot. If osteomyelitis is suspected, appropriate diagnostic measures include bone biopsy, propping the wound area to the bone with the SARS instrument, serial x-ray, MRI, mm. CT scan, and radio nucleotide uh, scans, uh, PET leukocyte scanning, technetium, and all of these depend on the faculty and the uh, availability of this modality of investigation. Osteomyelitis underlying a diabetic foot ulcer, like osteomyelitis elsewhere, is most effectively treated by the brightness of the infected bone when the brightness has been adequate. So the duration of the antibiotic from two to four weeks course of antibiotic is adequate. If the infection of the infected bone is totally, is not totally resected and removed, a longer course, more than six weeks, can be required. Antibiotic therapy should be targeted toward the aerobic uh, gram-positive cocci uh, in mild to moderate infection. Uh, severe infection should be treated with a broad spectrum and empiric, empiric antibiotic uh, pending the result of cultural sensitivity. The uh, uh, infectious, infectious Disease Society of America, sorry? You, you can summarize, you can summarize Dr. Ray. Yeah. Please, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is the suggested antibiotic for the antibiotic for the treatment of diabetic foot infection. We can see the mild infection and moderate to severe, and we can choose the type of the antibiotic that it is according to the gram positive and the gram negative and any rods. This is uh, recommended by the American College of Physicians. And the glycemic control, the glycemic control should be uh, the American College of, of Physicians recommended that the 140 of the milligram per, per, per deciliter should be the preprandial glucose and 50 to 200 milligram per deciliter in the critically ill patients. So it is uh, compared with the less intensive glycemic control therapy. Intensive uh, control may, be, may decrease the risk of the amputations in patients with diabetic foot syndrome. A uh, multidisciplinary team of care, it, is, uh, it should be, it's very numerous study and systemic review have showed positive effects on the multidisciplinary care in reducing wound healing time, the amputation rate and severity of, of, of amputation, reducing all of these things. Uh, uh, the team uh, often include the surgeons, general vascular orthopedic, podiatrist, nurse, the diabetologist, and the infectious disease okay, therapist, orthotic physical therapist, yeah, we've got one yes. minute. Thank you, thank, you thank you very much. This is the adjuvant therapy. This is the last thing we can add it. And the, the, the most effective one we are using in our practice is the vacuum, uh, the vacuum assisted, uh, the vacuum machine. And we are using in our practice, in our patients. And we have many other uh, adjuvant therapy like the oxygen therapy, the human growth factors, and the skin uh, graft and bioengineered skin also and the energy-based therapies like that. And this is my references, and thank you for your patience, uh, and thank you for all the audience. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Marwan, for the illustrative uh, presentation. And uh, now we will see the questions. We have like uh, three questions here from the participant. Uh, the first question is uh, regarding the appropriate type of dressing. Uh, is it uh, with go soaked in uh, saline or buffidone? This is by Asif, Dr. Asif. Can you answer this question? And the second question. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. If you have a case of uh, uh, a defect of skin and tissue in the plantar aspect, what is the best way of covering? Is it by skin graft or having a flap? And who uh, will do that? And uh, this question regarding the... Can you answer those two questions? I will go for the third one, please. 
Okay, the first one regarding the dressings that should be it should be moist the wound and it should be contained and count and mop the large exudates the diabetic foot. And this is we have we have many types of the dressing, but the simple way of the dressing to using for diabetic foot is the using of soft saline gauze with and it should be changed every day. Either it, it depends on the moderate of the exudate of the diabetic foot. If it is moderate, if it is severe, if it is high exudate, so the change that the, the, the frequency of the dressing change it should be increased. So, so if we don't have a, a high high quality of the dressing, we can use the simple one, uh, a saline a soft ghost. And okay. regarding the second question, yeah, and second regarding question. the planter, we know all of us we know the reason for the for the ulcer in the neuro and the planter is the neuropathic and due to uh, loss of the protective sensation and the also association of the peripheral uh, arterial disease either due to microangiopathy or macroangiopathy. So the healing, the, the coverage of the defect with the skin graft alone, I think it is not a good idea. So the healing with the full thickness graft is a good. And, uh, and this, this is the question, it is the speciality okay. of the plastic surgery. Thank okay. you very much. So can we go for the third and fourth question? The third one is regarding yes. uh, the offloading. Uh, do you recommend any yes. uh, special uh, type of prophylactic shoes? And the fourth one, is, is there any role for antifungal uh, coverage of those patients who are having uh, diabetic septic foot, uh, diabetic infection? The, regarding the offloading, definitely the offloading is very important, as, uh, as we said, because the, the sheer force of the plantar size and the pressures of the head of the metatarsal and loss of the arches. So the shear force will be redistributed all over the foot. So from the, from the beginning, if the patient is at risk, we have to advise him to go for the, uh, to custom a foot with the, to reduce the pressure. And the, there is many machines like foot printing machine, it will uh, clarify and give us the, uh, the summary about the, the high of the pressure size in the foot and according to that, they can uh, provide and custom the food suitable for the patient. And regarding the, anti, the using of the topical antifungal, definitely it is very helpful, especially for the mastina pedis, and because this is the, the it's, uh, it's uh, one from the causative effect of the infected diabetic foot. Okay. Thank you. Easily by using the topical antifungal between the, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let us move for the third session, and it will be with uh, Dr. Uh, Asif uh, Safati. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, it will be about the orthopedic uh, biomechanics principles of the diabetic foot. Uh, he is a consultant, a senior consultant, orthopedic surgeon in Al Qasim Hospital. Welcome, Dr. As Asameh, sorry. Malikim. <laughs> Hasib is the previous one. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. No, Samir. Sorry, sorry, Samir. You can't stop. No, it's not. It's like, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, يعني, I am included in, uh, in this diabetic foot conference or meeting by Dr. Tariq Mahdi. Thanks for him and thanks for everyone. Uh, I know that is, this is a pure surgical uh, problem. We are included in many items here. I will, uh, I will not uh, uh, go with um, a pure anatomy and pure uh, physiology and uh, management. No, no. I will talk about many items about relationship of orthopedic with a general surgery about diabetic foot. Diabetic foot, orthopedic biomechanic principle, Samah Safti Al Qasim Hospital Consultant also. Uh, we'll talk about eight point here. Introduction, biomechanic of ankle and foot, uh, hint only, and I will uh, talk about uh, some point, not by uh, clarify, clarify everything, complication of diabetes, osteomyelitis and diabetes, Charcot foot and the ankle, 
unhealed ulcer, new technique, types of amputations, and orthosis in diabetic foot. We'll go with introduction. Diabetic foot and ankle is a complex issue. It needs co-operations of many speciality as diabetologist, general surgery, plastic surgeon, vascular surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, endocrinologist, podiatrist, neurologist, and prothetist. Uh, MRB doctor was assigned according to the hospital protocol or a nation protocol. Always the leader here is a general surgeon doctor. We as orthopedic not included in management except in the following situation. أول حاجة الأستيومالايتس if you need the brightment. يعني if a general surgeon find this is an osteomyelitis, he take my consultation. Second is a sharp joint need fixation or arthroscopy. Third is a consultation about a level of amputation. Well, this is rarely happened, but uh, it may be for uh, not for amputation decision. No, no, no. For a level of amputation, and uh, if this level of amputation can affect gait or can affect weight bearing or not. There are other two neglected situations we can cover as a orthopedic surgeon. Uh, the first is unhealed ulcer. We do an old technique. Zgayr, we do not do it. We do not do it. We do not do it. Or prescription of the type of orthosis. We will go by biomechanic. The foot and the ankle have three functions. First, support body during stance, act as a lever arm for propulsions during gait, and shock absorption of forces during walking. So, they are very important in normal gait and balance, also in transmissions of weight bearing to the ground. Ankle has a three rocker. Rocker mean uh, uh, a waving shear. So uh, it's not uh, a rock, not a point, no, she waving to, to, to shock absorptions and to, to get, uh, gain a good range of motion and a good gait. The first is anterior leg muscle compartment. The second is the ankle plantar flexor. The third is a posterior gastrosoleus complex. Ankle and foot have a big role in gait. As in stance and the swing phase, there are three actions. First is a heel strike. Second is a full contact of the foot to the ground. Third is a push off. The foot is a tribudal contact for ground, like many feet in some bird and animal, with a wide arm along the metatarsal head and two long arms along the medial and the lateral ray of the foot connecting to the heel. I will, not go, I will not go through the anatomy, Dr. Dahlia finish everything about the anatomy. I will put a, a, some, some uh, uh, point only about this to know about what is the situation of food during the gait and during weight bearing. There are transverse mid-foot arch, and this arch, as Dr. Dahlia mentioned before, high from the medial and the more lower from the lateral, and this is have a cause. I will talk about it. Stability depends on muscle and ligament. Muscle and ligament are soft, we call it dynamic, because it does action. And bone and joint, we call it static, because it can hold the weight bearing and the, 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 the whole body during it. This is the three point. This one, this two, this three. This at the heel, this one at the heel. This point at the heel, this point at tarsal metatarsal, or the head of the first metatarsal. This point is fifth metatarsal. This is the arm between two, and this is the arm lateral arm, and this is the medial arm. So this is a tribudal, tribudal or triangle for weight bearing. This is a very important to take about or to decide about the level of amputation later. We'll will decide that. So I will mention in, in type of amputation later. This is also a very good uh, picture for that. This is medial ray, first and second third metatarsal. This is the lateral ray. It's more little, not stronger, and more little down. This is the fourth and fifth ray. This is the midfoot, and this is the talus and the calcaneus, and this is the tibia. So the ankle joint called here about modified hinge, not a hinge like a door. Not but a modified hinge. It it, it goes with a dorsiflexion and the plantar flexion, and it go with a mild subination and 
mild pronation and go with gliding after complete of dorsiflexion or plantar flexion. So it, it is a modified hinge, not a pure hinge. The first and second surgery are important in gait. Then fourth, and uh, this point is very important. Uh, we must know this point for, for, for amputation later or for many um, debridement or arthrodesis like that later also. So first and second and third ray, اللي هي بنسميها ال ال ااا uh, big two مثلا ده الفيرس تري معاها الفيرس متتارسل ده بيوصل لغاية فين ده مهم في الجيت then fourth and fifth ray they directly connect to three cuneiform middle medial and middle and the lateral cuneiform then to navicular then to the talus so عندي the first and second and third directly connect to three bones in the mid foot directly connect to Uh, navicular bone directly connected to the talus. So the talus is more higher than the calcaneus. This is the first one. I, I will show that photo now. Fourth and fifth connecting to the cuboid, then to the calcaneus. So they may be important in stance and stability. Uh, the bone uh, to take a stability here in stance is the calcaneus. And the bone to make a, a, a motion here, case tone, as Dr. Adelia said, If the cal uh, is a, a talus, so if the first and second third go to the talus, may be help in the gait. So we can preserve bone as we uh, we can, but we must after be, before preserving bone, we cannot cut. We, we are not a butcher, a butcher. No, no, no. We cannot cut, but we will see, we'll think about it. What's important of this bone? I will amputate. I will dislocate. I will remove, or I or, or I will try to keep. I must know that. The talus is a case tone of the ankle and the foot, collect and distribute the weight of the calcaneus of the foot. Stability depends on muscle and ligament, the dynamic stat exam. This is a very important photo. This is the first and second and third, medial, middle, cuneiform, navicular, and talus. Here, talus above the uh, higher level than calcaneus. It's the articulate with the calcaneus. Calcaneus stick with it. Cuboid, then the fifth and fourth. All this five metatarsal connecting with inter intermetatarsal ligament and uh, plantar, uh, fasc plantar fascia and plantar muscle and the interosseous ligament. All these bones are connected. All these bones are connected uh, with, with um, uh, ligament and with, uh, uh, with tendon and with, with everything. Best, but This is more little down than those three. So we must think about if we remove this one, we'll go to with dynamic. If we remove this one, we'll think about static. So this, this patient need uh, to stand or this patient have a daily life activity to walk like that. So we will think about what is important of, the, of every bone for stance and for feet. This is the ligament and the muscle of the foot. Uh, complication, diabetic complication can include nerve damage and poor blood circulation. This problem make the feet vulnerable to skin sore ulcers that can worsen quickly. This is a stage three in diabetic foot. By low immunity and recurrent ulcer foot will go to infection, then osteomyelitis, this is a great fall. Recurrent infection lead to sequestrum, osteolysis, joint subluxation and dislocation, this is sharp. So it is categorized. It's upgrading stage three if unhealed and complicated. Go to stage four. Stage four of unhealed, go to sharp. Uh, unhealed, go to necrosis. So stage five, unhealed, go to for amputation. So we can cut this visual circle from here, from the first. If we cannot, we go to the second, the third, for not going to the amputation. A diabetic foot also malets. I will I will talk three or four minutes about uh, uh, orthopedic view for uh, for diabetic foot. This is osteomyelitis diagnosis. Clinically maintain this way. This is charging sinus exposed bone. This is very important clinical view. Radiologically plain X-ray, MRI, CT, positron emission tomography, bony scan. This can be beneficial and more sensitive at the fourth day, fourth day and fifth day from the first. 
X-ray be later after two weeks or three weeks, they can give another thing like, like sequestrum, periosteal, uh, um, periosteal shadow, periosteal elevation, like that. Like in the very important is BET and the MRI at the first days for osteomyelitis. Laboratory is RCRB, white blood cell, blood culture, and this is not sensitive for the only osteomyelitis for many infection, but the, the more sensitive one is the bone culture. Treatment, surgical removal of involved bone, the sequestrectomy, sequestrectomy, resection of distal and the bride mento proximal, and this is very important uh, issue. What is the resection of distal? If I more, more distal, like in the two, like in the metatarsal, I must resect. If in, uh, I, I'm more proximal, osteomyelitis sliced, like ankle or distal tibia or talus or calcaneus, I must preserve the bone, so the bride mint and the bride mint and the bride mint. More, be, more, more than three times, no problem. So I can reserve the bone proximal, I can, I can resect the bone distal, and this is a basics. And this is a basics. Restoration of, of circulation by reaching to the healthy tissue, antimicrobial microbial therapy for four to six. Charcot ankle and foot. For charcot ankle treatment, depend on many factors, patient age, quality of life, and regular that can uh, walking, regular that can uh, make a sport, regular uh, um, standing a long time, like that is a teacher, is a doctor, level of blood sugar, mobility of other ankle and the history of surgical procedure before, and this is very important factor, lower mobility of the other ankle. Maybe the other ankle is uh, fused, maybe the other ankle is amputated, so we can save the, this ankle from amputation. Arthrodis by retrocalcinian nerve or Elizarov. For charcot foot, minimal fixation and arthrodis by Spro and Elizarov. Like that, this charcot, this charcot ankle and uh, foot. So we'll do retrocalcinian nerve from here to here and uh, curettage this area and maybe put bone graft if there is no osteomyelitis and we fix his ankle so it has a fixed painless ankle can move on this ankle without dorsal friction or plantar flexion, as it can move good with this ankle after arthritis. This also arthritis by Elizabeth. Unhealed arthritis is a new technique uh, can uh, yeah, take a benefit, uh, give a benefit for many patients, and many patients know when this multifactorial uh, uh, causes for, for, for healing for this ulcer. Treatment of unhealed ulcer refer to a plastic and general surgeon, but due to poor neurovascular theory, we as we as an orthopedic surgeon can help in the treatment by many successive trials depend on improvement of circulation around the ulcer. The ulcer here, il, il, ulcer here is a neurovascular compromise. So we need to increase the vascularity about and around this ulcer to make the ulcer here. So creation of a new angiogenesis, new angiogenesis, and the creation of a new osteogenesis, yeah, a new bone and a new vessel. If we save here and uh, create a new bone and create a new artery, feeding the artery, it can help the ulcer to heal. And this new angiogenesis and the new osteogenesis collectively called new histogenesis. Histogenesis. Histio means include everything, artery, nerve, uh, bone, anything. So stimulation also of nerve by regeneration by distraction. So this ulcer is more distant, <coughs> and this ulcer is more proximal at the heel. Will do. If we need here to make uh, to to encourage the circulation here, we can put osteotomy here at the midfoot, osteotomy at the midfoot, and you distract by Elizarov. So if we distract here. It can, it can create a new artery here and a new angiogenesis here to help uh, a good circulation here. If I proximal, I go proximal here. So if I put, uh, I do osteotomy at the bone, must, uh, this osteotomy must be proximal to the ulcer, like that photo. I will, I will show. This can be done by Elizarov, application after osteotomy of distraction and comparison technique. Osteotomy can be done at three level, mid shaft tibia by transverse uh, tractions, uh, supramalular by longitudinal distractions through metatarsal bone, and this is the photo. Here, if the ulcer here, 
I will do osteotomy here and distract by two, by, by these two uh, uh, ring. If ulcer here, I put osteotomy here and distract. So I help to give a, a create a new angiogenesis here and a new, uh, new bone. If here, خلاص, I will do distraction here, like this photo. We go with this, we cut this bone transversely and we go with Elizarov by olive wire here and distract mildly, mildly, mildly to get this healing. So it can help to create a new artery here, new artery with a new tributary and can help this tele and this can be uh, cleared by a CT angio. Risk factor of amputation. This is the last thing. Amputation has a risk factor, high blood sugar level, smoking, nerve damage, uh, callosis or corn, food deformity, poor blood circulation, history of foot ulcer, past amputation, vision impairment, this important kidney disease. Choosing amputation level. Certain factors affect the decision about amputation level. The first is the patient level of function. If some hope to walk, preserve as much of the lower extremity as you can. He said, a partial foot amputation is better than a baloney amputation. This is a saying of the patients, which is better than an above knee amputation. The basic principle, basic principle here of, uh, uh, basic principle here is to remove all the infected tissue to where you have a good circulation. Other issue about the type and extent of the surgery include the patient over all health and the ability to withstand anesthesia, the level at which there is adequate blood flow and potential for successful rehabilitation. This is uh, uh, for amputation. This is photo for amputation. We'll, we'll review. This is foot amputation. This is the level of tooth amputation. This is the level of transmetatarsal amputation. This is the level of less frank amputation. What about less frank? Less frank is tarsometatarsal. This tarsal bone, this metatarsal bone. So if this level is less frank, this level is Schubert amputation. Schubert joint between tarsal bone and talus here. Right. This Boyd amputation, I will remove here the, the talus and remove this area of calcaneus and Put uh, and uh, uh, do uh, make a, a arsal disease between tibia and the calcaneus this is called void amputation. If amputation here, it is say, uh, called symes amputation. So symes proximal, then void, then Schubert, then less front, then transmetatarsal, then to amputation. If you are going to talk uh, the two off, that is better than going higher. He said, if you can do transmetatarsal, that's good. Some hind foot amputation, such as Schubert, don't do so. We because of soft tissue balance, some people like some amputations because the patient can walk around at night without putting on the process. No need for this. Can we wrap within one minute? Okay, 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 okay. This is also no need. Uh, this is uh, amputation. Uh, I, we talk about the three-point fixation, so I will best uh, uh, give a comment here. If I uh, if I remove uh, leave this one, the patient can walk over this uh, first three and second set. If I leave this one, the patient cannot walk good, cannot walk better with this. So I must do all this area no need to preserve the three-point fixation in one, in one, and the heel. This is type of amputation. Back to the future, no problem. I will I will show us uh, type type of orthosis is the last type of orthosis here. Depend on what is said, uh, what's called about a foot scan. This is foot scan. No need for all. This is foot scan. This is a machine. The the patients stand on this machine. They take a point of uh, offloading. The point of high pressure. The point uh, cannot be uh, reach the ground and take the photo like that. This is uh, the, the red area with high pressure, green area with low pressure, uh, yellow area with mild pressure. So they do the custom made uh, for sources about uh, shoes about this area, like crown, like wet shoe, like custom made, like blast uh, zoot, elastic. And this is the pneumatic walker, take home message, Diabetic foot complication mainly due to impaired sensation blood supply as diabetic neuropathy, 
peripheral vascular disease and impaired mobility of the chronic ill patient. Diabetic foot is multi speciality cooperations. By good care and planning, you can prevent amputation in many cases. Sir Astley Peston Cooper, 1840, said he is a good surgeon who can amputate. He is a better surgeon who can save a limb. And thank you very much. Shukran. I am very sorry for uh, late. Oh, never mind. Thank you, Dr. Sami. This is an elegant, informative presentation. Uh, let us go to the questions. Uh, we have uh, like uh, two uh, questions. The first question is uh, regarding the amputation of the big toe. Uh, one of the participants is asking, does it affect the balance and biomechanics of the foot? This is the first one. And the other uh, question is by uh, Professor Tariq. How does the amputation at the level of the metatarsal affect the biomechanics. I guess this is one question. We can join them. You can yes, answer yes, them in yes. one answer. I told, I told, I, I told the first the, yeah. the, the anatomy uh, to to tell about that about what about the level of amputation. How can I choose? So I can go with aggressive, aggressive, aggressive management, aggressive man management of that. And I will go with amputation according to the level of circulation. So I choose that I will remove the big two. So I will remember big two. What is uh, the function of big two here? The big two have in the gate push off. This is the first one for the gate, a low stance phase, then swing. I will push off by big two to take the first step for me. If I lose big two, I will lose the first step for me, a push off. So it can affect. Uh, the the gate that cannot affect the the the, the, the weight bearing or the stance. You can stance without the big two. You can stance without the little two. Like you cannot go to a weight a, a gate propulsion. This propulsion is quite dafa. This propulsion cannot be good with the big two amputation. So if I need to remove the big two, I remove it and uh, uh, can can spare this one by uh, um, a custom made prosthesis. They do something holding this area to get something, uh, some sort of push off. But okay. uh, it's multifactorial here because the soft tissue is not good for the diabetes. The general condition is good not for diabetes. So the push off not bony only, the bony and the muscle and uh, other other thing. So the patient can accept accept the gait with limping gait without big two, no problem for. Okay. The other, the other in the tarsal metatarsal, if yeah. I need to, uh, to remove some area before the midfoot, for me and for biomechanic, Allah, I will remove all to give the patients a good and wide area for ground reactions to take his gait. But he will take a gait like a, a, a duck also. He will get a take without propulsion, like a duck, like that. So, if I need to remove, and I will choose by removing the first ray or the fifth ray, and this, if the fifth ray is not good and gangrene, I will remove all, no problem. If the first ray is, uh, is not good, I will remove first to fifth to bring a three-point fixation for this uh, patient to go with it. Okay, regarding the question of Dr. Ahmed for antibiotic, antimicrobial treatment, I guess this will be a limit for Dr. Ahmed Subhi in his lecture. And uh, Dr. Pili is asking, uh, is uh, SIMS uh, operation or amputation still viable and done here in UAE or not? For antibiotic? For SIMS. Antibiotic will leave it for Dr. Ahmed Subhi. Yes, yes. Regarding the SIMS am uh, amputation. amputation. SIMS, SIMS amputation, yes. Yeah. Is it still viable? They are doing it still here in UAE. She's asking about that. I am, here, I am here. I am here since five months. I didn't do here. No consultation for me to do. But in Egypt, I did many cases for science amputation. The patients can prefer these amputations plus for a, a rehab, good rehabilitation and prosthesis, uh, like fitness prosthesis. So after one month or one and a half months, he can walk with a prosthetic food. So many patients prefer this type of amputation. And many other patients has a little, little age, prefer a Boyd's amputation. They have a point, point, this Boyd amputation have a point like, like a heel. 
so he can he can go with this without wearing any shoes so okay. they prefer shoes they go to with times amputation other not prefer shoes at night so they go with void amputation and there are two questions uh, from Dr. Haider and Dr. Amr. I get they are interrelated. We can merge them together. Uh, is, uh, can we preserve the big toe in spite of uh, resection of the ferrous metatarsal? Cannot be. If I, yeah. leave, if I leave base of metatarsal, I can preserve with a distractions, with a mini XFX and distraction callotesis. We call, we call it callotesis. So if I have a part like a base of metatarsal only, I can preserve the big two if the circulation is good. Circulation is good and there is a soft tissue coverage. I can preserve and put a bone graft or do a distractions and do an, uh, another one uh, like metatarsal, new metatarsal with a distraction. This is, inshallah, my job. Like in, if there is no soft tissue coverage, no good circulation for a big two, and no metatarsal at all, I cannot preserve it. Thank you very much. Again, there is no more question. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so let us move uh, to the fourth session, and it will be delivered by uh, Professor Ahmed, uh, Senior Consultant Vascular Surgeon in Ras al Khaima. Uh, you are most welcome, Dr. Ahmed, to the stage. It will be about the vascular role in diabetic fibula. Unmute uh, voice. Dr. Ahmed, can you hear me? Yes, Doctor. Salam alaikum. Marhab, Doctor Ahmed Subhi. Abu Naja. Ahlan. Abu Naja. Doctor Ahmed. Make unmute, Dr. Ahmed. Amy. Release unmute. Dr. Ahmed. Yeah, 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 that was okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa Good evening, everybody. Uh, hope you are okay and your family and safe. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tarek, for uh, inviting me for this meeting. Uh, and you great effort for weekly organization of scientific meeting. Uh, today, we'll speak about diabetic food. And as we all know, that diabetic food is a multidisciplinary team and it's a major health problem. So the many subspecialties involved, like Dr. Sam Hittel, she needs general surgery, vascular surgery, orthopedic surgery. Last Dr. Ahmed, please, you yes. can share. We didn't see your, your presentation. Thank you. Share screen. One minute. Share screen. It's okay sharing now? No. Hold this. Hold this. Okay sharing now? No. Yes. Sharing? No. Dr. Ahmed, open, open the presentation first on your... Uh, yes, now, now. It's okay. Yes, yes. So today, we'll, uh, it is, uh, uh, as we will concentrate on the vascular problem, as we all know that diabetes continue to be the single most common underlying cause for low limb amputation. And it is a major health problem in these days. So the principle of diabetic food development is peripheral neuropathy, structural deformity, infection, and the peripheral arterial disease. All these factors are present, but one of these factors is more poignant than the other. 
the basic success of the good treatment and the good result for the management of the diabetic foot is to know what is the main etiology of this problem. Either this problem is due to neuropathy, diabetic non-ischemic foot, or due to ischemia, this called diabetic ischemic foot. So we have two big issues, either diabetic non-ischemic foot and diabetic ischemic foot. The diabetic neuropathic foot or diabetic non-ischemic foot there is, will be antiquipedal pulse, and the ulcer mostly will be oval, a partial area with plantar surface. The ulcer is mostly deep and painless, like this ulcer, deep and painless and red because there's no ischemia. For ischemic foot ulcer, the ulcer is superficial, painful, and there will be no pedal pulse, and this will be total change in the lower limb. So why is the patient with diabetes are more prone to the lymphatic ulcer? So the three main factor is neuropathy, as we said, infection and ischemia. For neuropathy, the patient is susceptible for obesity trauma because loss of sensation and with disturbance of the pressure area will be a hot spot development and callus development. The callus will increase the pressure over some area, more than 30% of the normal pressure. And with lack of sensation, there will be a repeated trauma in the food. This, the, this is the pressure area that would be having in the diabetic food. Also deformity, as Dr. Samah and Dr. Uh, Dalia discussed for the deformity because there's neuropathy, affection of the small muscle of the foot will lead to deformity of the foot. This deformity will lead to pressure in, ab in abnormal area of the foot that not used to a pressure like this hammering of the toes with two pressure on the tip of the toes and the interphalangeal joint. This will lead to ulcer and pressure ulcer in the heel in the, this pressure area. And the ulcer will be over a pressure area and the callosities around it. This is a neuropathic ulcer. This is a flat foot with pressure in the plantar surface of the foot with loss of the ouch, with a major ouch the pressure in this area and ulcer. Also, the impairment of the sensation and impairment of the uh, autonomic nervous system is lead to affection of the sweet glands, that the skin will be dry and the crack, this cracking skin will lead to ulceration and infection of the food. Second etiology is the infection. Infection, mostly because there's dry skin, crack of the skin, also lead to entering of the bacteria, and with the diabetes, with decreased immunity, because leukocytosis transfusion, transformation is affected, chemotax is affected, phagocytosis is affected, will lead to infection. Infection should be diagnosed early and managed aggressively. Mostly to be discussed in detail with Dr. Ahmad Subih for infection. But we have to know the cardinal sign of infection, systemic, if the infection is deep and severe, will be fever, high tension, tight cardiac shells, and local infection is to be hot, wet, tender, swollen, and loss of function. The microbiology will be, we need to have to take a deep culture from the wound, from the wound, and we have to start with both spectrum antibiotic to hit the organism until the culture is, result is there. Then we escalate the antibiotic according to the culture, but we have to start with Old spectrum antibiotics sometimes we start by many type combination to, to hit the antibiotic to the, the microbes and then be late within the culture. As we see, the, the ulcer will be apparent small, but there's some extension of the infection along the tendon of the of the tendon of the toes, extension of flexor tendon. So the maybe the won't appear small but the infection is spreading up and or down. So we have to see this sometimes extension of the, the plantar surface of the foot, the infection will be deep seated and not like that we see only. Sometimes the infection will collect is called protohepatitis of the foot, this plantar area. So the clinical picture sometimes don't match with the extent of infection in the foot. If there's good vascularity, so the bite should be aggressive, which remove all necrotic tissue and remove all the unhealthy tissue until we reach a bleeding tissue. If this vascularity is good and this is good pulsation in the foot. 
the risk factor of osteomyelitis, like Dr. Sameh said, if the, the bone is visible or the ulcer is big or, or the ulcer duration is, is, is uh, for a long time, and the most cost effective, like Dr. Sameh said, is surgical dividing of the necrotic bone if it's feasible to remove this necrotic bone and long standing antibiotic for a long time. Now we will consider about ischemia, which is called diabetic ischemic food. So the, the second main, main category is diabetic ischemic food. So diabetes is both developed born to develop ischemia. They have either macroangiopathy or microangiopathy. Microangiopathy affects the digital vessel. So that tissue fusion is affected. And the macroangiopathy will affect the medium and small size vessel. Both of macro and the microangiopathy will impair the blood supply that need for healing of diabetic food. So clinically, for diabetic ischemic food, there will be absent medial pulse. Most of the diabetic patients have femoral pulse. Mostly, more than 80% will have popliteal pulse, and they will be have absent medial pulse because the disease is affecting mostly the, the tibial vessel, anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and the brain out. Mostly, the popliteal pulse is zero in the diabetic food. Sometimes, it affects the femoral out and it's not zero, so we have to have a good vascular examination like the toe. Marwan said, and the ankle breaker index. Ankle breaker index with diabetics mostly give a, a wrong result, high, because the vessel is calcified, so it's not compressed. The ankle breaker index would be more than 1.3, like Dr. Marwan said, so it give a wrong result. So if it's high, so it is, it is wrong. So the ulcer in the diabetic ischemic food will be superficial ulcer because it's painful ulcer. The patient asks for uh, medical advice soon because the ulcer is painful and superficial. Uh, the ulcer would be pale and ischemic because there's no good blood supply, there's no edema, no much offensive discharge, no much infection because there's no culture for the bacteria. And there will be atrophic change in the limb in the form of brittle nail, uh, loss of uh, subcutaneous uh, tissue, loss of hair, the atrophic change of the chronic ischemia of the limb. There will also be history of collocation pain or some history pain. So diabetic ischemic food, we call it about critical lower limb ischemia, because if the patient with ischemia and diabetic food ulcer, it's a critical limb. If you can't manage broadly and early, this patient is more liable for major amputation. So we have to manage it broadly and early. There's some picture of diabetic ischemic food. We so see the food is mummified, the gangrene is mummified, no much edema, no much infection, no much discharge, because there's no much blood supply, no, no fluid inside the food, so it's mummified. Another picture for diabetic ischemic food. This is also diabetic ischemic food. This after femoral and tubal bypass with good granulation tissue and start healing of the bone. So the patient with diabetic ischemic food with investigation, the non-invasive investigation is double scan like the brown said. We have to see the anterior tubal, the osteotibial flow, and see the vessel and calcification. And the pre operative investigation, when we decide to make intervention for this patient for revascularization, we have to do angiogram, either conventional angiogram or C angio. CT angio is the, is the gold standard now. But with patient with impaired renal function, with good femoral and uterine pulse, you can make direct angiogram through so direct femoral puncture and make angiogram and angioplasty and in the same session. So it would be diagnostic and therapeutic in the same session. So patient who's old can withstand long uh, uh, dye injection or has any impairment, you can do angiogram, conventional angiogram, and angioplasty in the same session to use the contrast injection. So the management of diabetic ischemic food, the goal, the goal of it to relieve the ischemic pain and to leave the healing of the ulcer and to prevent limb loss and improve patient function and the quality of life and the prolonged survival. A primary outcome would be a mutation free survival. So the goal is to restore the blood supply to the food, then manage the patient like diabetic non ischemic food. So the management of diabetic ischemic food is not simple. It's only multidisciplinary effort can be provide long standing results. So it have to have control of blood sugar, control of anemia, help of anemia, and to have a good dressing. Limb revascularization either by bus surgery or blind angioplasty will be with or without stenting. So in the past, the surgery was the only solution before the angioplasty came. It was need uh, by bus, either femoral distal and tibial or bypass, or 
this bypass need a, a softness vein graph. Sometimes the softness vein is not there or it's bad uh, type, and it's long operation and uh, it needs general anesthesia. So the, it was reserved for some selected patient. Now angioplasty is simple, doing under local anesthesia, it can be done and it can repeat many times, no problem. And so a balloon angioplasty solves the problem of diabetic ischemic foot for a long for a number of patients because it's under local anesthesia, very simple and can be repeatable and the result is very satisfactory. It is short, short, uh, short standing, so it lasts for six months and then include again, but this six months is enough for healing of this ulcer of diabetic foot ulcer. Recent data supports the role of percutaneous revascularization in this setting as a SHIBA and probably as effective treatment. The pattern of vascular affection in diabetic foot, this is proximal affection in superficial femoral artery. It's not common. The most common is tibial disease, affection below the bodicial artery, the anterior tibial and the posterior tibial affection. So most of diabetic patients, as we said, has femoral and bodicial pulse and absent cervical pulse. There are some cases with diabetic ischemic foods. This first case, 60 years old male, diabetic smoker with bronchial asthma, presented with an unhealed stump of the big toe after big time residual four weeks duration. This is the stump of the big toe. This is duplex scan, posterior tibial artery show biphasic flow. The anterior tibial artery show monophasic flow. This is the angiogram. This is the anterior tibial. This starts in the origin of the anterior tibial. And there's no good on off, perineal, tibiobrineal tongue, and pseudotypal and the perineal outing. We managed to pass the stenosis of the antitypal outing, but we can't go through the omen. So we passed by a loop, subentimal angioplasty, reaching to the dosage bit outing, then straight the outing and pass the balloon, and they make balloon angioplasty, and we get a dosage bit pulse. Second case, 69 years old male, smoker, diabetic, hypertensive. Chemical disease presented with unhealed stumble of the big toe amputation and the gangrene of the rest of the toes, five weeks duration. This is the gangrene of the other toes. Duplex ultrasound, posterior tibial artery is monophysic flow. And this is the angiogram. This is the anterior tibial artery, full of calcification and full of synotic segment. This is the perineal outy and the gift to it to the posterior tibial outy. Posterior tibial is good from the ocean. We managed to pass the wire through the anterior tibial outy till the dosage speeds outy and make balloon angioplasty of the whole anterior tibial outy and we get a dosage speeds pulse after that. Third case, 65 years old lady with diabetic hypertensive presented with forced to gangrene of three weeks duration. This is the gangrene, the first toe. This is the anterior tibial artery, weak by physical flow, and the posterior tibial artery. This is the angiogram, this is the anterior tibial artery, full of calcification, perineal and the posterior tibial artery not continuous. The posterior tibial artery is reconstruction in the ankle joint, anterior tibial artery finish at the middle of the leg, and the perineal artery finish as is usual with some stenotic area. We managed to pass the wire to the posterior tibial artery until the arch of the foot. Then we make balloon angioplasty of the posterior tibial artery. And then we get a good flow to the posterior tibial artery with the gain of the posterior tibial pulse. So the diabetic foot, as we said, is either two big categories. Diabetic non-ischemic foot with pedal pulse, we will make drainage department and antibiotic and good dressing and uh, good foot wearing, so it will heal. For diabetic ischemic foot with no pulse, we have to refer this patient to vascular surgeon for trial of revascularization with either by bus, which was not commonly done today for diabetic foot, is only by done by angioplasty with, without stenting. Then we will manage this patient like diabetic non ischemic foot, either by drainage, department, then by drainage, department, and antibiotic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for the nice presentation. Uh, we'll go to the chat box and see our, our questions. Uh, there is the one question regarding an unhealing ulcer in diabetics. Are there any special laboratory tests 
to be done. In that case, laboratory, laboratory is not not healing also. Yes, non healing also. We have to check diabetic ischemic or non ischemic. If there's pulse. So we have to, sh to check for underlying cause of unhealing. Is there is yeah, yes. there is a pressure area, we have to offload this area. If there is ischemia, there's no pulse, we have to make some investigation to be sure by duplex and angiogram, then correct the ischemic element of this food and mostly it will heal in Charlie. If I'm not wrong, I guess he's asking about what caused the delay of healing. Laboratory tests like the protein levels, the hemoglobin, the oxygenation, <laughs> the other vitamins. Yeah, I think the systemic factor and local factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good hemoglobin, good uh, so, uh, yeah. uh, oxygenation in the blood, good yeah. uh, level. So oh. generally, good cardiac uh, function, injection fraction. Oh. Or okay. local, it will be either local infection or pressure area or something. And there is also a related question from Dr. Billy. Uh, he's asking about the ESR and CRB. Are they a good marker for osteomyelitis? Anyone can answer if you want. Osteomyelitis. Uh, osteomyelitis, mostly it will be ideological, ideological uh, diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Totally. With soft tissue inflammation also. Totally agree. And there is a question here from uh, Dr. Tariq. He is asking about uh, doing CT uh, angiogramming case of ischemia in patients who are having like uh, renal impairment. Can we avoid that by doing any procedures? Or yes. If the, if the, well, if it's femoral and bubicial buzz, we go directly for direct angiogram, femoral function, the same name. Direct angiogram and angioplasty will take about 15 to 20 cc of contrast, this minimal amount to not affect the kidney. If the patient has no potential pulse and we are afraid that this superficial femoral affection, we either go MR angiogram, but this, the result of tibial uh, imaging in this MRA is not good, so we can make C2, C2O angiogram. I think it's available in your Qasimi hospital. Okay, and there is also uh, a question from uh, Dr. Tariq uh, relating to the timing of stenting before amputation. Stenting for TBL disease, stenting is only done if there's uh, flow limiting dissection, if there's dissection and flow limiting, we have both at uh, stent. So if there is recoil of the vessel after two or three times of dilatation and to recoil more than 50%, so we put a stent in this area. So it's selective stenting, it's not routine. The routine stenting, it will be in the aorta and carotid in the iliac vessel. But the TBL, it's only on, when indicated, when there's complication. After angioplasty, if there's dissection with flow limiting, you have to put a stent. Or if there's recoil after many dilatation, we have to put a stent. Okay. But it's not routine to put stent in the TBL vessel. And there is a question from Dr. Hassan uh, regarding the management of colors in diabetic food. I guess we will leave this for uh, Dr. Billy. Uh, she's a podiatrist and she's, uh, yes. that's her specialty. Yeah. Any other questions or comment? Or shall we move to the fifth session? So we'll move to the fifth session. Uh, the topic is uh, antibiotic in diabetic food, and it will be driven by uh, Dr. Ahmed Subhi, who is a senior consultant in infectious disease in Al Qasim Hospital. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Thank you, Dr. Fathi, and thank Very you welcome. for having me here today. Uh, inshallah, today we'll uh, be finishing on time uh, with my presentation and. Uh, I just want to mention that it was an excellent discussion, excellent uh, presentation by all other uh, colleagues, to be honest with you. A few things I want to just answer briefly, just from my infection doctor standpoint. Uh, some people, they raised a question about fungal infection role. Very, very unlikely to have fungal infection in deep ulcerative or osteomyelitis uh, infection, mainly in immune, comp uh, immune competent patient. And even in immune compromise, we're not talking about immune compromised diabetic patient because some liter literature is saying that diabetic patient is immune compromised or renal failure patient. We're talking about immune compromised patient who they have really immune suppression in their cellular and humoral uh, activity or immunity. But otherwise, it's very, very unlikely 
that you have candida or you have uh, malassezia furfur that is going to give you deep infection or osteomyelitis. CRP or ESR for uh, osteomyelitis, uh, I think CRP is more helpful than ESR, more uh, specific, but uh, preferably not to do, uh, if you treat osteomyelitis for six weeks, and we're gonna come into that part in my presentation, you don't wanna check the e CRP every day. That uh, culture of checking CRP every day is not very helpful, especially in long-term antibiotic therapy. Usually what we do for endocarditis, for osteomyelitis, when we treat those patients for six or eight weeks sometimes of antibiotic, we check it on weekly basis or maximum twice a week, and we check the trend. If we see just a single rise in one number, but then it comes down, that has no meaning. But if the trend keeps going up, that tells you that either there is treatment failure or there is something else that we're not covering well with the antibiotic. Uh, regarding the revascularization, again, from infectious diseases standpoint, we prefer to have the revascularization done by vascular surgery or by uh, uh, interventional radiologist or by cardiologist who's doing peripheral uh, stenting before we have the amputation for one reason, because Better vascularization means better healing of the stump itself. So it's not just a matter of uh, cho uh, chopping the, the foot, for example, because then the same problem that you face with done healing ulcer, you will face it with the surgical stump itself. So always vascular surgeon or whoever is gonna do any intervention, we prefer to do it before we do the amputation. I will go to my presentation and I have nothing to disclose. Uh, the uh, diabetic foot, uh, uh, as Dr. Marwan and other speakers, they talked about, uh, it affects about uh, 15 to 20% of diabetic patients. And out of those patients, about one-fifth, they require amputation. Uh, in diabetic patient, the foot ulcer and the infected foot ulcer and deeper infection could cause up to one quarter of the mortalities in those diabetic patients. We see this problem more with type 2 diabetes, more than type 1. And usually the most common risk factors is the peripheral neuropathy uh, itself. Uh, usually peripheral neuropathy, 18 to 90% may be part of those patients. They could have on the top of it, peripheral vascular disease, neuroischemia, and this peripheral neuropathy could be sensory, could be motor, could be uh, autonomic. And the peripheral vascular disease, as uh, the other colleagues, uh, they mentioned, it's either micro or macro angiopathy. And uh, the neuroischemic also is the commonest uh, in the, uh, among the risk factor uh, list. Uh, you can, uh, based on the pathology, you can uh, classify those uh, 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 diabetic foot into either normal one or patient who has uh, his foot at risk to develop a foot ulcer or infection. Uh, the longer the duration of the diabetes, the more risk. The poorly controlled diabetes itself or uh, blood sugar is another risk factor. Development of peripheral vascular disease, neuropathy, having a foot deformity or a, a dryness of the skin or the development of callus, a decreased immunity, as we said, and uh, sometimes those patients, they might have more than one reason to be immune compromised, whether it's a mild reason to be immune compromised as diabetic, kidney problem, or even more advanced immune suppression or uh, uh, compromise. Uh, uh, having previous amputation is another risk factor to have an open wound that became ulcerative uh, as well. Stage four, stage three, where you have the ulcerati ulcerated foot itself, and then stage four, that ulcerated foot became infected, whether it's just a cellulitis, where the surrounding skin become infected, or development of subcutaneous or deeper abscess, or even uh, osteomyelitis. Then you have the necrotic part, and then you reach stage six where the foot or the limb itself is unsalvageable. There is another classification that some people, they use uh, the Wagner's classification. And again, it goes into six stages from stage zero all the way down uh, to stage five. And the third one that they use in USA, for example, is the University of Texas classification. This is a unique one because they have a stage and they have a grade. The grade is grade zero, one, two, three, depends on the depth or the uh, severity of the uh, wound penetration. And then the stages from A, B, C, and D, whether there is an, either infection or ischemia or neither or combined. So this is another way that they could classify the diabetic uh, uh, ulcer. 
the uh, investigation part, uh, checking serum glucose level and hemoglobin A1C, that will give you an idea how uh, the serum glucose uh, controlled uh, over the last two to three months. And then you can get anything from uh, wound swab to tissue biopsy or even a bone biopsy that you send for uh, microbiology. Routinely, you do uh, the arterial uh, Doppler of the lower extremities. And then getting a plain x-ray is not a bad idea to start with uh, to see if there is gas in the soft tissue or even if there is a long-term osteomyelitis, you can even pick it up from the plain x-ray no need for CT or even uh, MRI. And geography is also important. And then we can do more advanced imaging if the plain X-ray is not very helpful, or you think that maybe this osteomyelitis developed recently, there is no enough time that uh, this osteo will be picked up by the plain uh, X-ray. Uh, this is just to show you that some of those people with the diabetic peripheral neuropathy, you could find any of these uh, sharp uh, objects in their foot or in their uh, shoes. And this is the main reason for developing a, a foot ulcer that is difficult to be healed and then uh, became secondary uh, infected with the uh, bacteria. Treatment in general is multidisciplinary, medical, surgical, uh, interventional. And the medical part is uh, number one, uh, glycemic control, uh, controlling any other comorbidities and controlling the infection if there is any infection that uh, was developed. Uh, IDSA or Infectious Disease Society, they have a very nice uh, guideline about the management of uh, the treatment of diabetic uh, foot uh, uh, ulcer. And usually they say that even based on the classification of the diabetic foot, you can have an idea or you can have a prediction about what the percentage of the mortality, anywhere from zero up to 90% when there is a necrotic and severe infection, deep infection of the limb itself. Uh, there is a few things that you need uh, to remember. Number one, the uh, clinical assessment is very important because it will tell you to, if the foot or the wound ulcer is infected or not infected. So if the, by clinical exam, if there is an uninfected wound, there is even no recommendation to take any specimen for culture because sometimes if there is no clinical exam or clinical uh, reason to have an infection, if you take a swab, this swab might show you something that the wound is colonized with. This is not an actual infection. Then, if you have a, a, an infected wound, it's better to get this sample, number one, prior to the initiation of antibiotics, to have a fresh sample that you can send for culture. There, is, uh, or there are some exceptions that you can consider. If the patient is severely septic, uh, 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 hemodynamically unstable, uh, came into septic shock, uh, you might, to, it's not a bad idea to start the uh, treatment upfront, even before getting uh, the culture, if it's not available or uh, possible. Uh, the specimen should be sent if from the deep tissue, and this is by either the uh, biopsy of, or the cure test that can be done after cleaning the wound or doing a debridement. The reason for doing debridement uh, initially, before you get the sample from the deeper part, you want to just get rid of any bacteria that uh, the wound itself could be colonized with. Because the foot ulcer, the more chronic that you have this, or the longer that you have this wound ulcer, the more chance that it will be colonized with even more than one bacteria. So it's better to do some type of debridement before you get uh, your sample that you send it for uh, microbiology. The uninfected wound that shouldn't be treated, as we said, with antibiotic. And then for the infected wound, uh, the, it depends on the severity of the infection. You can decide about uh, starting with oral antibiotic versus parenteral antibiotic, doing one antibiotic or more than one. Again, depends on how, for how long you have this uh, foot ulcer. The longer you have it, the more chance that there is a polymicrobial uh, infection that uh, uh, happened. This is what I meant because if you have an early infection, or the patient recently developed foot ulcer, maybe uh, the gram-positive cocci like staph or strep are number one a microorganism that you need to cover because those two bacteria, they are part of the normal skin flora. So early infection means that this infection happened because of a skin flora bacteria. If you have a patient who has this ulcer for a longer period of time, maybe you start thinking about gram-negative or even anaerobic 
coverage. And whenever you think about the gram negative, you should consider pseudomonas coverage as well as part of the uh, antibiotic uh, uh, regimen. Uh, the MRSA, it depends on if this patient has risk of developing MRSA based on the uh, number of the local prevalence of the MRSA in your region, based on the number of cases in your hospital. Is this patient coming from another hospital or is a dialysis patient where there is risk that the patient could acquire the MRSA from one reason or another? Or patients, for example, in the Western countries who they come from a nursing home, those are, they tend to have more risk of getting MRSA infection more than the patient who's coming from the community. So the consideration for antibiotic coverage depends on each case uh, by, by itself. Uh, the, uh, as, again, as I said that sometimes the oral antibiotic is enough to treat a, a mild uh, diabetic foot ulcer that become uh, infected, or if there is a deeper infection or osteomyelitis, maybe you have to go with the IV uh, option. Whenever you decide about oral regimen, it's good to choose an antibiotic that has a good oral bioavailability, which means that the oral route is very close in, in, in case in, or regard to the potency or the effectiveness close to the IV uh, uh, formula. For example, one of them is the uh, amoxiclav or augmentin. The augmentin oral, about 85% of the IV uh, formula. So this is one good option to use. Quinolone, for example, levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin, they are almost 90 or 90% equal to the IV uh, route or IV formula. Some of the medication that you have to use, maybe there is no uh, alternative oral uh, formula for those medications such as vancomycin. Duration of therapy, usually if it's a, a mild, simple infection, maybe one to two weeks of treatment is more than enough. If you have complicated skin and soft tissue infection, maybe you need to go a minimum of two weeks. And then the deeper the infection, the more uh, or the longer the duration of the of the treatment till you reach the level of the osteomyelitis where you have to treat on average eight week, uh, six to eight weeks uh, in in general uh, some other things that that for the osteomyelitis uh, how to diagnose uh, the best way to diagnose the osteomyelitis uh, some uh, uh, clinician or guidelines they recommend to do the probe to bone because this is a simple way to test for uh, uh, if there is an, a diabetic foot infection and underlying uh, osteomyelitis. And then the, uh, this is from the IDSA as well, where they said the diagnostic accuracy of uh, probe to bone to detect osteomyelitis in diabetic uh, foot ulcer. If there is no uh, uh, sharp uh, decision about whether this patient has osteomyelitis or not by the clinical exam or the diagnostic test, then you have to go with the imaging studies. And we said that usually the MRI is the gold standard to be uh, used for the diagnosis. If it's unavailable, if it's contraindicated, maybe the white blood cell uh, scan test, this is one other option, or a CT scan may be another way to consider. And if not, then you can do a bone scan for the diagnosis. There is one problem with the bone scan uh, uh, in some cases of uh, infected osteomyelitis. If there is a surrounding skin and soft tissue infection, the area that is going to light up from the bone scan, sometimes you cannot tell if it's coming from the bone itself or from the infection of the surrounding uh, uh, soft tissue area. So sometimes it's very hard to uh, make a definitive uh, diagnosis uh, from that. And then after that, you can go, if there is an osteomyelitis, preferably if you have an interventional radiologist or orthopedic doctor, preferably we can get a, a bone biopsy itself because that will give you more accurate uh, idea about the causative microorganism than doing a culture from the deep wound or even the tunneling. Even if you have a tunneling or a, a sinus tract, Sometimes if you get a sample from that sinus uh, tract, it might not reflect the actual microorganism that is uh, causing the osteomyelitis. Treatment-wise, again, it depends on how chronic or for how long you've been having this infection. Uh, is the patient has recurrent infection? 
what previous antibiotic therapy that we used for, to treat previous infection, because if there is recurrent infection, it means that there is more chance that the patient might have uh, developed a, a, a multi-drug resistant gram negative or gram positive bacteria. If the patient has recurrent skin infection, there is maybe a chance that not just a staph aureus or strip is the reason for the infection, it's more polymicrobial growth. So this will depend on the uh, clinical assessment of uh, each case that we uh, evaluate. If the patient is uh, severely infected, critically ill, maybe you want to start with a broad spectrum antibiotic and then de-escalate. If the patient has mild or moderate infection, maybe you can start with the common uh, or antibiotic that covers the common microorganism. And then once you have a definitive culture, you can escalate or adjust according to the uh, culture uh, result. This is some of the, just an example uh, uh, for uh, developing a, an algorithm or a flowchart for patients who they come with infected diabetic uh, foot ulcer. And this is from St. Patrick Hospital in Montana State in US, where they classified the patient with diabetic foot infection or ulcer into three classes, mild, moderate, and severe. And based on the, each class or each group of those patients, they wanted to subdivide those patients for those who they have MRSA or there is no risk for MRSA, because that will give you an idea about which antibiotic you're gonna choose whether it's for outpatient therapy or uh, the inpatient. Uh, the other thing is about the duration of the treatment. As we said, it's anywhere from one to two weeks for mild to moderate infections, severe or complicated skin and soft tissue. You might need to go longer than that, up to six weeks of therapy when there is osteomyelitis. When you have amputation done, if the amputation of the foot or the limb uh, ended up with no residual infection, you don't need to have the antibiotic after surgery for a long period of time. So if you are able as an orthopedic doctor or general surgeon to achieve the clean margin from the amputation itself, then the duration of therapy of the, the amputation shouldn't be more than three to five days of treatment. If there is any residual bone infection, then you are stuck to treat with six weeks of therapy after the surgery. If there, is no, if there is no osteomyelitis, residual osteomyelitis, but for example, there is residual bone, skin and soft tissue infection, you might need to treat for maybe 10 to 14 days of treatment. So it's always good to know from the surgeon whether there is residual infection. If yes, is it a residual bone infection or residual skin and soft tissue infection? Because that, that will determine the antibiotic of choice uh, after the, uh, the, the duration and the antibiotic of choice after the surgery uh, itself. These are some of the references that I used. And thank you very much for listening and I'm ready for any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed, for the nice presentation. And let us see the chat for uh, questions. I get the first question is uh, regarding doxycycline. Is it a good option? for uh, treatment of uh, an infected diabetic ulcer? If there is wound infection, Dr. Fethi, uh, it's a good option. The problem is if you have a deeper infection uh, or th there is osteomyelitis, doxycycline is not a good choice uh, for uh, treatment. But if you have a diabetic foot ulcer, uh, superficial, and you wanna treat, uh, doxycycline is, is a good option. Doxycycline works on uh, staph, it works uh, uh, on uh, strip bacteria. Uh, so as a superficial infection, it's not a bad choice, but anything deeper than just a superficial ulcer or foot superficial wound might not be a good choice to use uh, doxycycline. Oh, good, and there is uh, another question from the same uh, doctor, Dr. Billy, is uh, procalcitonin a good marker to improve the diagnosis of bacterial infection and to guide antibiotic therapy? Uh, not for osteomyelitis or skin. Procalcitonin, when it was discovered initially, it was a marker for, they said for two things, uh, pneumonia and bacteremia. Or if you have sepsis from either of these two infections. For example, mm -hmm. for example, meningitis doesn't give you a high procalcitonin. So having a normal procalcitonin in a febrile patient who's confused and there is many possibility of meningitis, it doesn't give you a high procalcitonin. So not every single infection 
could give you a high, high procalcitonin. That's why osteomyelitis is not one of those uh, uh, infections that could give you a high procalcitonin. To rely on procalcitonin to decide or to make a definitive diagnosis of osteomyelitis, for example, or a skin and soft tissue infection, if there is no bacteremia with it, it's not a good marker to use. Okay, uh, regarding the, this is a question from me, regarding the early and late infections, the presentation, you mean the presentation or the duration of the ulcer? Because that will affect, as you said, the uh, antibiotic uh, tools. Yes, Doctor. The early infection, the early infection, usually it's more with the gram-positive cocci. The early infection, because the gram-positive cocci, whether it's a staph aureus, whether it's a MRSA or MSSA or strep bacteria, those are the most common organism that most of our skin is colonized with. So that's why when you have an early infection, usually it's more with the gram-positive cocci than anything else. Okay. There is some exception, for example. You might have a, a deep skin and soft tissue infection without wound or necrotizing fasciitis from clostridium, for example, an immune compromised or diabetic patient. But if we are talking about classical diabetic foot ulcer, early infection more with the gram-positive. Later on, when you have a delayed a wound or chronic wound, the longer you have the wound, the more chance that it becomes polymicrobial. And when it becomes polymicrobial, you should start thinking not just the gram-positive cocci, maybe there is anaerobic, maybe there is gram-negative that you need to cover uh, for with antibiotic. Okay, there's another question also from Dr. Asif. He's asking if there is any role for acetic acid for treating uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection locally? Mm, no, to be honest with you, I don't have any, any experience uh, with it. So I, I can't answer this question. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. there is a question from Dr. Mataz also regarding CRB. Can we follow up the patient here uh, or the wound healing by CRP? No. Or because, will it come to the normal level? Yeah, okay. Right, right. No, no, Doctor. Because we have to differentiate. And as Dr. Ahmed said, there is systemic and there is local reason for the delay in the wound healing. So you might have a sterile wound, but that sterile wound might stay unhealed for weeks maybe. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that there is an underlying infection. I've seen many patients who they have a diabetic foot ulcer that's very difficult to achieve a full healing or full closure of the wound without having any infection. All markers are normal. So, so CRP will reflect if there was an underlying infection and you treated properly with antibiotic to sterilize the wound. But that shouldn't be an index or marker to tell you if the wound is gonna be healed, even if the, mar the CRP is gonna stay normal for weeks, for example, many weeks. But the, the healing process is not totally depending on the infection and CRP. Sometimes you, you, you treat the infection nicely with the proper antibiotic, with the proper duration, but you end up with the diabetic foot ulcer that is not fully healed for another reason, whether it's a local reason or systemic reason. Okay, that is the last question here from Dr. Mohammed Hani. What is your uh, empiric treatment uh, choice for uh, diabetic foot? Uh, for early infection, or if you have this wound uh, recently developed, uh, for outpatient, clindamycin might be a good choice with maybe uh, a penicillin uh, uh, products such as uh, augmentin, for example, if there is no chance of MRSA. Clindamycin has some MRSA coverage. You have trimethoprim sulfur. This is another good choice that works more on the staph bacteria but doesn't have an excellent coverage on strep. So usually I combine trimethoprim sulfur maybe with a cephalosporin, oral cephalosporin. Doxycycline is another good choice for outpatient, but also doxycycline works more on staph aureus more than strep bacteria. So to cover for the strep bacteria part, you might also need to add penicillin or cephalosporin orally. For hospitalized patient, maybe you want to jump into the IV because I assume that if the patient ended up in the hospital for that diabetic infection, that means that this is more advanced infection. Maybe the oral option 
is not ideal or proper at that time. So you maybe you start with ticoplanin if you want to avoid vancomycin. You can have digicycline that has good stuff, strep bacteria, gram negative. Uh, you can have linazolid. And of course, you can escalate if you want to have gram negative coverage with peptazo or carbapenem, for example. Okay. Thank you very much. I guess there are no more Thank questions. You. Thank, Thank you, you very much again. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, let us move to the last uh, session, uh, which is uh, supposed to be delivered by Dr. Billy, uh, who is a specialized uh, podiatrician in Mohab, United Arab Emirates. You are welcome to the stage, Dr. Pili. Hello, how are you? Masal khair to everyone. Um, I will switch off the camera because the connection is really bad here. Okay, so let me share this. Let me see. Okay. Okay, can you see can you see the presentation? Yes. Yeah? Okay, perfect. So I'll start now. Okay. So then Marcel head to everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this diabetic food clinical discussion. It has been very interesting, all the sessions. Uh, today I would like to talk about the role of the podiatrist in the diabetic food of loading. Um, this title already leads us to two questions. What is a podiatrist and the diabetic foot of loading? I know Mr. Marwan spoke a little bit about um, the offloading. Why is not working? Okay, now. Okay. So, uh, but anyway, I will dip more into the, into the offloading. Firstly, um, I will begin with the figure of the podiatrist. This is the gesture from people when they, they ask me, what is your job? And I say, I'm a podiatrist. So they put this face like, I don't understand what you're saying. So even they confuse me with, um, with a pediatrician. But I've seen that Dr. Marwan and Dr. Sami already know because they put it in the slides like a, a multidisciplinary uh, team. So a podiatrist, this is uh, the topic that we'll talk about, a little bit about the role of the podiatrist the loving treatment, and then a little bit of wound care dressing because Dr. Tarek asked me to talk about this. Okay, the podiatrist is a healthcare professional who specializes in the prevention, diagnosis, treatment of deformities, pathologies, and injuries of the foot and the associated structures. Treatments, for example, we can do surgery or we can do orthosis. Um, nowadays, because of the aging population, the raising rate of diabetes and the prevalence of obesity, there is an ever-growing demand of podiatrists. Uh, they, they figure that in the States, there is one podiatrist for every 20,000 Americans. Here, I don't know, we are like more, uh, more or less 30 podiatrists. So imagine yes, how many podiatrists are for every Emirati citizen. Okay, what is our role? Uh, we are um, involved in the management of the, uh, of the diabetic food and other things as well, yes, but because today is about the diabetic. And uh, our main task is the regular food assessment. We do some, uh, in, includes the vascular assessment, dermatological, musculoskeletical, um, and, uh, and the dermatological, yeah, yeah, I don't, assessment, okay. So another thing is identification of the food at risk. Uh, educate the patient, it's very important. The management of the non ulcerative pathologies like hyperkeratosis or elomas and uh, psoriasis as well, and management of diabetic ulcers. Okay. Uh, I put this slide because it's really very important to work in a disciplinary team. Uh, there is a significant amount of data that shows the inclusion of the podiatrist reduces amputation. For example, in the Netherlands, there were some studies that they said that they, they reduced a 34%, and the USA, a 64%. Okay, so let's go for the next question. What is offloading? Offloading is just to remove or minimize the weight placed on the foot to help prevent and heal ulcers. Uh, managing the diabetes foot ulcer requires a holistic and multidisciplinary approach. It's not just offloading. If we don't use the brightman of the wound, 
uh, good dressing selection, infection control, pre uh, management of chronic peripheral ischemia, metabolic control and treatment of comor comorbidities, and adequate nutrition and, phys and physiological care, we will fail. So we always depend on other professionals to treat this uh, um, pathology. It is, I always say that it is like a jigsaw. Yes? We are a piece of the jigsaw, and there are others as well, and we complement. Okay, so this, this sentence, I like it very much because it, it tells us that we must treat the whole patient and not just the whole in the patient. Yes? We have to see the whole uh, the, um, um, atmosphere, everything. Okay, then about the, the food assessment, I will not go very deep, but uh, I will just let you know that, for example, it's very, very important to take the patients when the patients come to check their food. As um, I don't remember, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Rafant, I think that uh, he was talking about to check inside the shoes because this maybe can be a pin or, or stone and it can provoke um, uh, an ulcer. So it's very important to check. The, uh, this is a very cause, uh, this is a very important cause for trauma in the neuropathic food. See, all these are examples of things, uh, shoes that our patients shouldn't take uh, or shouldn't wear. Okay, the International Working Group on the Diabetic Food, as Dr. Marwan already mentioned, uh, they, they designed some guidelines. Uh, this group, I think it was born in 1997, and since then they have been releasing guidelines. These guidelines, uh, they have 26, uh, they, they are translated into 26 uh, languages, and they appear every four years. Uh, they are free to upload. Here is, uh, let me put this on the laser. Here you have the, um, the website. Okay. So one of the first recommendations they give is to protect your feet, well, your feet, the patient's foot, with, uh, uh, they have to be protected and not to walk barefoot, socks or thin soles or slippers. Yeah? Sometimes I see patients that they come barefoot and then it can provoke, I've seen patients that with, with burning on the sole of the feet because they have been going to the, to the malls or, or in the garden, they are in the garden without shoes. Uh, a lot of people with the slippers as well. So this doesn't protect, it doesn't hold the feet. It doesn't control the ankle. Another recommendation is always to wear properly fitting footwear. Yes. So we will give them some indica indications where to buy it, and the characteristics of the food. This it would be another subject, another uh, seminar, just because we can say one hour talking about the shoes and what shoes is the best for every activity. Is not a shoe for everything. We have shoes for, uh, for sports, we have shoes for walking, uh, for going shopping. So it's not the same for everything. Okay, so now I will go straight to the offloading guidelines. Uh, we start, it, it's gonna be like nine guidelines, uh, nine recommendations. So we will start from the premise that all the patients are diabetic. And in this case, there is a neuropathic forefoot or midfoot ulcer. As a first choice, these guidelines recommend a non-removable knee-high device. Okay, here I will show you what is a non-removable knee-high uploading device. The gold standard is the total contact cast. Yes, that uh, this is the, was the gold standard. But now, since last year, they introduced another one. It's a non-removable walker that is converted in irremovable. What does it mean? This uh, this is called the instant total cast total contact cast that it was introduced by Dr. Armstrong uh, and his colleagues in 12, um, 2002. So what they do is this, they just take the removable uh, cast walker and they convert it in an irremovable, how? Just uh, wrapping with Coban. Okay. Um, then the total contact cast and then as well the removable cast walker that now is irremovable, they are now the gold standard for the treatment of the plantar pressures for patients with neuropathic ulcers. Uh, they, 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 uh, there are systematic reviews that they tell us that they significantly improve the healing of the neuropathic plantar foot compared with removable platelets. Um, they reduce the pressures at the site by 84%, 92%, and have the ability to heal most diabetic neuropathic ulcers in six, eight um, weeks. 
And as well, it can, uh, it can be useful for controlling edema and the oceans changes in um, uh, charcoal food. Of course, we have some adverse effects. That is like the patient, of course, it has to wear this 24 seven hours, so, uh, 24 seven. What happens then that it can provoke some muscle weakness, increase risk of falls because it leads to a normal gait and imbalance, and then it can give another new ulcers like this one, this is a real case, uh, because it was compressing too much. And then, of course, it can create a limb length discrepancy because the other foot, uh, it's a, it, 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 we make it like uh, shorter. Okay, so uh, healing of the ulcers using uh, the total contact cast takes approximately more or less six to eight weeks. During uh, this time, the cast, the cast is replaced, hmm? usually it's every week. After which is recommended that the diabetic patient were specially designed, uh, designed shoes. Sometimes in the clinic, we don't change it every week, and what we do is a, is a window. This way we can open, uh, with this window we can see the ulcer and change the dressing. Okay, a good idea as well, it would be to hand a set of instructions to the patient, where it is specified, for example, that the cat has to keep it dry, we have to notify to the doctor if it feels that it's too loose or broken or cracked, or there is or the patient has uh, fever, swelling, pain, numbness, excessive odor uh, that comes from the cast. Okay, okay. then uh, contraindications: a heavily exudating ulcer, both mild infection or mild ischemia, or either moderate infection or moderate ischemia, both moderate infection and moderate ischemia, or either severe infection or severe ischemia, bilateral ulceration, obesity, and ataxia gait. And ataxia gait, of course, it's an uncoordinated movement, so it can give an steady staggering gait. Okay, so we we should do, uh, if we put one of these cuts, it's very important, and I, I've hardly seen this, uh, to use one of these devices, it's called a sure right, to prevent our patients from having some future uh, issues like back pain or, or knee pain, hip pain, and because this it will improve the balance, it will reduce the body strain as well, and it will compensate this acquired leg, uh, leg length discrepancy. Okay, as a second recommendation, we have as well the neuropathic ulcer in the same place, and we're gonna use a non removable of knee high floating device when the other one, the previous one, it's not indicated or is not tolerated. So we can choose this one. We always have to encourage the patient to wear it because this is one of the problems we have. The patients, uh, they, don't, they don't wear it because uh, they get tired of using this. As a removable knee high floating device, we have these ones, these two, and uh, it's, this is, they are very easily removed to inspect the, the wounds, to wash the, the wounds, to change the dressings. Uh, allows the patient to ambulate because it has a rocker, uh, a rocker sole. And it's an excel, excellent alternative to the total cast, like I said before, in, in patients that they have vascular disease like ischemia. Uh, the only problem uh, is what I was mentioning before, is the non adherence of the patient, that they remove this one. So there were some studies that said that the patients only use uh, these devices between two and, uh, two and 28% of the working hours. Okay, the third recommendation is as well, uh, an neuropathic plantar forefoot or milfoot. So for whom a knee high of floating device is not tolerated, then we will put a removable ankle high of floating device. That it can be these two. It, it can be the, the four foot wounds, uh, for the four, uh, treatment for four, wound, uh, four foot wounds. Uh, it gives a 10% um, degree of dorsiflexion at the ankle. And then we have the other one that is the rear off uh, loading shoes. It's treatment for rear foot wounds and it forces the majority of the weight to the arch and the forefoot. Okay, as a fourth recommendation, we will have. Um, we, they are talking about that instruct the patient not to use the normal and convention therapeutic footwear if they have a plantar ulcer. If they cannot use the other uh, devices we mentioned before, what we're going to do is consider the cell form yes, that we can do in our clinic. We can do the shape we need it. See, there are different shapes here. And we can combine it with a fitting or standard therapeutic footwear. 
uh, five recommendation, now we are talking about metatarsal head ulcers, yes? So it's another one. What we want to do, if the non-surgical of loading treatment fails, the conventional treatment fails, we are going to do uh, an Achilles tendon lengthening or metatarsal head resection, yes? Because usually we find a contracture of the gastrocnemius solis muscle complex and Achilles tendon, yes? And, uh, and this is associated with uh, four foot plantar pressure. Six recommendation, uh, if we have a digital ulcer in this case, we are going to consider digital flexor tenotomy to prevent the healing of the ulcer, as well if the other uh, devices are not working well. The seventh recommendation is about the total cast. If he's talking about uh, what I told you before, about the, um, the disadvantages or when not to use the total cast. Yeah? So we are not going to use the total cast. Uh, with mild infection, uh, mild infection or mild ischemia. Oh, no, see, sorry, in this one, we, we use a non-removable knee high of, uh, of loading device. So it's with mild infection or mild ischemia. In a person with both mild infection and mild ischemia, or with either moderate infection or moderate ischemia, we will use a removable knee high of loading device. And in a person with moderate infection and moderate ischemia, or with either severe infection or severe ischemia, first of all, we will address the infection. And then we will consider a removal of fluid. Okay, I'm finishing now with the recommendation. Um, then we will use a knee high uploading device or other uploading intervention, yes, to reduce plantar pressure on the heel, yes, if it's tolerated. So now we have an ulcer on the heel. Uh, this one, okay? And the last recommendation these guidelines are giving us is non-plantar foot ulcer, we're gonna use a removable ankle high of loading device, footwear modifications, tour spacers, or orthosis. Here I have some examples that we made. Uh, see, we have the custom-made orthosis that we make it in our clinic, the silicone as well, that these silicone it, it, for a professional, it, it's easy to do. We can do it in five minutes. They can wash it at home, they, and, and they, they can last one year easily. This is the ankle foot orthosis as well, and then this is the footwear modification. Okay, this is the flow diagram that I explained you before, so I'm not going to explain it again. And this is the last part, yes? So it's just the dressing selection. It's very quick. It's, before we apply a dressing, we have to talk about the anatomy. We have to know where is the ulcer, the anatomic location, if it's the wound partial thickness or full thickness, is the wound contaminated, infected, if the, it has tunneling and undermining edges, uh, the volume of restoration, the condition of the belly bound, how often should the, dre the dressing be changed, who's gonna change the dressing, it's, it's important to know if it's, he's going, he will come to our clinic every two, three days, or if someone at home, the wife, or the nurse. The other day I, I found someone, in, uh, the wife of one of my patients, that she's depriving. She's not even a nurse, yes, but she's like, okay, <laughs> I told her, be careful. But uh, some people uh, are very courageous to do these things. And then, who's the payer as well? It's very important. Yeah, you cannot apply some dressings to patients that they cannot pay. And this is a dressing selection, and it, it, this would take another hour, yeah, to talk about this. We can find from alginate, uh, when there is a moderate to high exudation wound, uh, then even honey as well. Sometimes we, we use honey for low to moderate exudation wounds, uh, hydrogel when it's uh, dry or low uh, exudation, uh, iodine as well, or, uh, or silver, yes, so that, that it has an antimicrobial action. But for example, this one, we have to discontinue after two weeks, there's no improvement, and, uh, and sometimes it can cause sensitivity. Okay then. So, as, uh, to, to brief up everything and uh, a take-home message I want to give is the ideal position uh, for the podiatrist is within a larger community of specialists because of the importance of the multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary approach to diabetic limb sandwich. Each member of this multidisciplinary team will bring a set of skills and knowledge that will contribute toward this effort. Uh, we will use uh, appropriate footwear and this will be the, the, this will help prevent first ulcers. 
and the offloading is possible, the most important intervention with the strongest evidence available for healing food ulcers and reducing the global burden of diabetic food disease. And education is really important, and it has to be individual, individualized uh, to be success, successful. We need if, uh, to call the patient's family to come and we explain them if, if the patient is not able to understand what we're explaining. So I would like to finish with this inspiring and powerful quote from Hippocrates, the father of the Western medicine. It says, before you heal someone, ask him if he's willing to give up the things that make him sick. Because I would add, otherwise, yes, our, our efforts will fail. Yes? So the patient has to be compliant and, and has to be willing to follow our advice. Okay then, so and with that bring us to the end. I would like to thank you and the organizers for your time and, and attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pili. It is okay. uh, a nice uh, presentation. So there I hope is... I didn't bore you. <laughs> <laughs> there is uh, one question uh, from Wait. Dr. Mohammed. Yeah. Remove this weight. <laughs> Like, Are you hearing me? Yes, I hear you, but I don't know how to remove these things. Uh, he's asking <laughs> so about scary. if you can I recommend think. a commercial ready-made shoes which are affordable and proof I like it. Boof. Well, I cannot give a, a, a commercial <laughs> names, but I, I know some places that they have like... So you can be in private. You can contact in private, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you can contact and I will give it, yes, because, yeah, yeah they, they contact have, in because, private, please, Dr. Mohammed Hani. Yes. So we give them money. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, it, it's, not the, it, it's not the brand, it's the characteristics of okay. the shoes, yes. No. So we need something that has two box that is big, uh, spacious inside, and with back support. So, so nowadays, even uh, so as a good sandal, it's good. If you can, for example, remove the insert inside to put okay. another insert. Insert. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know why I cannot remove this. So <laughs> Sorry. So we'll hand it the mic to Dr. Tariq just to wrap up the webinar and have his uh, last comment. Then. Okay. Dr. Tariq? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. No, no more questions? Okay, I cannot remove this. Sorry. I will <laughs> remove it. Don't worry. I think it's okay. Yes, no more question. There is no more question. There is no more question, yeah. Okay, is this that, is the, that is the last one you know added. The management of colors. Ah uh, yeah, you told me before, yeah, it's true. The management of colors is the debridement. We have to debride. Yes. Yeah. Because okay. To remove all these all these uh environmental Colors. Tissue. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you for uh, all speakers. Uh, thank you for uh, Professor Daria, Dr. Samah, uh, Dr. Marwan, Dr. Ahmed uh, Khalab, Dr. Ahmed Subhi, and uh, thank you, Barry, for a very nice uh, lecture. We are enjoying really with your lecture. I don't know what is your name, is Barry or uh, Pilar? Pilar, Pilar. It, it doesn't matter, it's a Pilar. 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 But Pili yeah. is a nickname. I don't know what it appears. Nickname, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like? Uh, the original one? Or? Pilar is fine. Okay. Pilar is fine. It's Pilar. Okay. Thank you, Pilar, yeah. for your uh, yeah. lectures. And yeah. uh, next week we have another uh, webinar. We have Sassy by Partition online webinar. Dr. Almantus, Dr. Uh, uh, Mohammed Hefi, Dr. Carl Frederick Shaw, Dr. Uh, Michelle Kramer, and me will have a good. Uh, discussion about Sassy by Partition. Uh, Dr. Almantis will tell us about new uh, technique in Sassy by Partition without stabler. And uh, Dr. Mohammed Hefi will tell us about Sassy by Partition in Kuwait. And also Dr. Carl Friedrich Show will tell us a Sassy by Partition as an option for uh, both sleeve weight regain. And uh, Dr. Michel Kramer will tell us how to treat the reflux esophagitis with sassy by partition. And the last lecture for me, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to explore why we have a discrepancy of result of sassy by partition, especially in Egypt, in Cairo, not in all Egypt. 
and in Saudi Arabia. And I will uh, explore and uh, have some clue about why the result in uh, Riyadh, per se, and Cairo is uh, not a good uh, uh, result as regard for the other country in Gulf or uh, Germany, Turkey, and uh, uh, Lithuania, and Portugal, and Germany. So we'll discuss in detail. So I hope all of you, you can uh, uh, share us. And thank you uh, for all uh, uh, audience also. And uh, thank you again to uh, uh, all of our speakers. Thank you for all. all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Time thank for the end of our meeting. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you.